Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, CIS Controls, Use Cases in Cost Justification, with Michael Betty and Brian Cusack from Tripwire. I'm Liz Fox, Senior Marketing Events Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of today's event. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation is a live video panel with slides. Video plays through the media player widget in the webcast console on your screen. If you'd like to minimize or change the size of the video or any of the other widgets, you may do so using the icons in the top right corner of each widget. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console. If you have questions during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. Our speakers will remain on the line to answer questions at the conclusion of the webinar. We will also be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand webinar following today's event and instructions on how to receive CPE credits. So now let's get started by introducing our panel. Our first speaker today is Michael Betty. Mike is a senior systems engineer for Tripwire and has been working in the security field for over 20 years, where he visits customers on site and helps them plan out their approach to security. He believes that security products by themselves do not protect a company. You need good people and processes in place and a way to validate those processes, along with a defense in-depth approach. Our second speaker is Brian Cusack. Brian is a senior systems engineer at Tripwire, where he spent the last 15 years. With over 20 years of experience in the IT industry, Brian's goal is to help customers better understand the rapidly evolving IT security landscape and to find effective methods to reduce risk for their organization. So now, without further delay, I will turn it over to Mike and Brian. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Liz. All right, so we're going to just go through the agenda here to lay out uh, how we're going to attack the topic today. Uh, and we're first really going to talk about the, the, the need to really efficiently, cost-effectively approach IT security and the different ways that companies have chosen to do this. And, uh, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, very much the CIS critical security controls. We'll talk a little bit about the background of those controls, as well as uh, the CIS's secure configuration recommendations. And then we're going to talk more generally through some of the use cases uh, that Michael and I uh, have been have put together for today. Okay, first I want to go through a couple of assumptions. Uh, the first of which is that uh, you know, in IT security generally, in IT compliance as well, even ops, uh, our assumption is that most of you all have more work to do than you have time to do it, that you have more things that need doing than you have the resources to do. And so, you know, this puts real pressure on IT security staffs, IT security, uh, IT staffs generally, uh, to get more work, work done with fewer resources. Uh, we're also assuming that you have some sort of compliance uh, requirement that you have to comply with. Uh, and most of the industries that Tripwire works with have some sort of a compliance, that, uh, you know, uh, rock that they have to deal with. Uh, the other thing that kind of goes hand in hand with compliance requirements is the idea that IT security typically lacks budget. Uh, in most of my experiences, and I'd be interested, Mike, if you had it seen it differently, most of the time it's the compliance team that sort of gets the budget because there's some sort of a stick, some sort of a thing that they will have to pay a fine for or not be able to do or have to pay more for if they're found to be non-compliant. And that's where the resources go rather than, you know, straight up IT security is the right thing to do and we should do it. Uh, and then we'll, yes. Go ahead, Mike. Wait, are you agreeing with me? I'm All just right. agreeing and, with you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll talk about uh, how expensive breaches actually are as a way to sort of uh, further cement that. Okay, so this is a, a snapshot that I took from an IBM uh, presentation on uh, how much breaches cost today. And this shows, for example, that in the US, the average cost of a breach, uh, as far as the data they have for 2020, comes to over eight and a half million dollars. And, and I wanna be clear that that's the average, right? Which means that there are some breaches that were significantly more expensive. Uh, also really important is the time to identify and contain, which they show as 237 days on average. Uh, it came down from the year before where the cost of the breach has gone up. 
and they show that healthcare uh, is the, the absolute costliest industry in terms of uh, breaches. All of which is really interesting. You can see at the bottom of that are some of the global numbers, uh, the global averages. Uh, things tend to cost more in the States than they do elsewhere, it would appear. And I just want to sort of, in the context of, uh, you know, how do we attack IT security? How do we do it efficiently? How do we avoid uh, a breach most effectively? Uh, you know, I want you to think back to uh, one of the first companies that I uh, worked with when I came to Tripwire, and that was the TJX companies. Now, the estimate on how much that breach ended up costing them ranges between 160 million and up to 300 million, all told, when you include you know legal fees and suits and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the target breach is estimated around 150 to 170 million. Uh, the list goes on, and it's important to note that. In most of those cases, uh, basic IT security controls could have helped avoid those problems. Uh, and that's something that Mike and I are going to spend a fair amount of time talking about today. Okay, so I think it's fair to say that breaches are expensive. Part of the problem in IT security is just there's too much information. I mean, if you think about it, a firewall can generate millions of events per day. And if you've got hundreds or even thousands of assets that you're working with, you know, there's just a ton of data to work through to try and find that nugget of this is, you know, this is an indication that there's a problem. So that's on the event side. Then you think about right. vulnerabilities. Uh, most of you all have vulnerability management solutions in place. And if you have any size of uh, an environment, you're gonna end up with hundreds, if not thousands of high severity vulnerabilities. And the question becomes, which of my tens is the most 10, right? How, how do I figure out where to begin my remediation effort? Because there's just so much. Right, but Brian, you do realize that change management has some of those same problems with so many changes across so many systems. It's a lot of data that actually generates data overload as well. So a big part of what I wanna make sure I cover during this webinar is how do you deal with all that change? You know, how do you rank it? Um, how do you deal with the risks involved? And you know, what happens if you don't figure out accepted change from unexpected change? Right, because the whole goal there, I mean, if you look at there's there are compliance standards out there with requirements around being able to differentiate between good and bad change. Uh, from a, an IT security perspective, it's a critical control as we'll see a little bit later on, but it's interesting how often that's not seen as a actual security control. Right, and so th this is the point, right? There are thousands of different IT security uh, and compliance controls out there. There are thousands of different uh, solutions you could use. And the question becomes, how on earth do you ever figure out what it is that you're gonna do first? And so you, of course, then do what I do, which is ask yourself, what would your accountant do? And the reason I say that is that um, in a, if you're an accountant, you have a thing called generally accepted accounting principles. And there's a lot to it, but the, the basic uh, idea as it pertains to IT security is that it represents a standard of care. And uh, a standard of care is a legal term, which means that essentially uh, the result is if I'm an accountant and I follow the recommendations for how to do accounting that are in generally accepted accounting principles and something goes wrong, I'm not likely to be sued for negligence because I was doing things in the way that the industry says is best practice. And unfortunately, there isn't really a similar standard that's generally accepted in IT security. Uh, right. So, you know, Brian, are you saying that when auditors come into my environment, they're really looking just to make sure that I'm covering generally accepted practices, not that I'm actually secure? <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting conversation to have about the difference between compliance and actual security. Absolutely. Uh, I thought you were going to go a different direction and talk about how often people change auditors when they get bad news from the first one. That's a different story. <laughs> okay, so part of the, uh, you know, the, the major sort of underlying idea in what Mike and I want to talk about today is the CIS crit uh, 20 critical security controls. 
And in this slide, I've got the, you know, the link to the history page. It's actually on the SANS website of where this came from. And you know, there, there are a couple of, I think, critical uh, um, aspects that I want to make sure that we, we dive into. So one of them is the idea that the, the 20 critical security controls actually came from the Department of Defense wanting a way to prioritize the government's own cybersecurity efforts. And given the lack of generally accepted you know, IT security principles, um, they went to the NSA because the NSA had uh, you know, a direct line to how the government is being attacked uh, electronically. So they essentially started to work together to come up with a prioritized approach for how to attack IT security. Over time, it expanded, more different entities became involved in the process, uh, including entities from other countries, uh, large companies, um, other parts of the government, uh, and all with the idea of how do we truly attack this in a way that's gonna make the most sense, both in terms of the amount of time that we have, the resources that we have in a prioritized way. Uh, and I think, the the bolded sentence in this slide is really important because it says, and I quote, no control should be made a priority unless it could be shown to stop or mitigate a known attack, right? So their point is, you don't get to be in the 20 critical security controls unless you actually do the job. And I think that's one of the things that separates the CIS control, list of controls from other lists of controls. Okay, so here it is. Uh, the CIS 20 critical security controls. And what we're gonna focus on today is the basic controls. And so if you're not familiar with the CIS 20, the idea is that they have laid out how uh, to attack IT security, again, based on this background of controls that have proven to be effective, uh, and, and then ordered them in their effectiveness. And there are a couple of things that I wanna point out. Uh, number one, I believe, uh, so the CIS says the, the single most important IT security control, top of the list is you have to know what's on your network. That's what's in your environment, what systems there are. The second thing you have to do is know what software is running on what's on those systems that are on your network. And then the third requirement is, or control, is vulnerability management. And of course, you can't do vulnerability management if you don't know what systems are on your network and you don't know what software is running on them. Right, so those three really kind of go together. Uh, the fourth control is identity and access management. Uh, and then the fifth control is focused on secure configuration and change management. And the sixth control is log and SIM. What's interesting about this, I think, are a couple of things. Number one, uh, Tripwire solves five of the six basic controls. We've got solutions to solve one, two, three, five, and six, and we can even provide uh, evidence for control number four, although we are not an identity and access management tool. I want to be clear about that. Um, I believe that in, you know, in the context of having uh, a, a standard of care in IT security, this is the way that many companies are going. And I think it makes a lot of sense, given the fact that this li list is regularly updated. Now, there are a couple of other things I just want to point out. Number one, it's my assertion that if you lined up 10 CISOs and asked them, how do you attack IT security? What are your priorities? You would get at least 15 different stories from those 10 CISOs, right? That there's not a lot of agreement. And I think that is um, in part because, uh, you know, part of the CISO ethos is that you, um, you know, that you bring your experience and talents to the job. And so, of course, you've got your own way of doing things based on what you've seen that's important. You know, it's more of an art in that sense than it is a science. And I see the 20 critical security controls as the science behind that and, and the way to attack it. Um, number two, I also assert that if you ask those 10 CISOs, how many of you all are doing penetration testing? I bet all 10 are. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One, it's a well-known and understood security control. Two, it's a fairly compact package that you can contract with somebody to just do for you. Uh, you know, and it, it makes a lot of sense. That is a critical security control, but according to the CIS, that's control number 20 on the list. And what they're saying is if you haven't done one through six, then of course you're gonna find problems with seven through 20, 
You need to attack them one after the next. And Brian, the first six actually build on each other. I mean, you need to do number one and number two to effectively start doing number three, because you need to know uh, what am I going to check for vulnerabilities. If you aren't looking at all your assets, if you don't know where they're at, you're not going to find all the vulnerabilities. If you don't know what all your assets are and your software is, then your security configurations, how will you know what to check? Um, how can you secure the configurations? And then where are you going to get logs from? You may be missing logs from various pieces of hardware if you don't know where it all is. And there's other reasons you may be missing logs too, but I'll go into that in, in a short bit. Perfect. That's great. And I, I just want to say that the um, this is a slide that I like for a couple of reasons. One, I think it communicates the idea that uh, according to the IT Process Institute, you can detect or avoid better than 90% of all security breaches simply by doing foundational controls. Uh, I think that's important. Number two, I think it's also interesting that as you look in, so the, I've got more, more details here for each of these controls. Uh, you know, as you look at the, the details, you know, do vulnerability management, do configuration assessment, do change management, do log and security event management, uh, you know, those are not the exciting, cool, it, happening part of IT security. You know, uh, people want to do data loss prevention or be a pen tester. That's cool. That's exciting. In fact, again, it's my assertion that a lot of IT security shops don't see change management as a security control. And, and that is interesting because if you look back at many of the breaches uh, that we've seen over the years, bad actors have been able to get onto production systems in one case, create massive files full of data and milk that data over time. And the company had no idea that those things were happening because they were not on top of change management, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, again, the, the premise is that these are the basic IT security controls. This is where you're going to uh, get your biggest bang for your buck as you work your way through this. Right. And it, for example, it, you know, CIS, you have the security control number five. And one of those as an example would be to track success and failure of logins. Now that's actually something that needs to be there for security control number six, because you're supposed to log those things. But if you don't turn on the configuration setting to log and create logs for log on success and failure, you're never going to see those. So control six becomes a lot less effective unless you are doing the things in control number five. You know, each OS and, and application have lots of configuration settings. CIS, as well as a few other bodies, you know, uh, NIST, um, ISO have come up with, you know, for various operating systems, applications, network devices, here's how to secure your configurations. And as Brian said, you know, the majority of breaches could have been prevented if you just set your CIS configuration policies. And, but there's a lot of different things to fix and remediate in an environment generally when you start looking at these. And I've had a, a lot of customers say, well, where do I start? And to me, you know, you start, well, with the basics. Um, obviously, the CIS spec, as I said here, the CIS spec is long and full of detail. <laughs> um, but you need, so, you know, prioritize. And, and, and everything about the CIS controls is about prioritizing. That's why they have them in an order. That's why the order builds on each other. And when you're starting to do each of the separate controls, you also need to prioritize. And what I like to prioritize, say, from the CIS audit policies is the um, CIS number five is the secure configurations. 
So the audit policies in the CIS checks, um, if you do those first, A, it's an easy win. Um, it's pretty easy to go in and turn on um, success and failure audit policies. Uh, a lot of cases in Windows, it's just group policy object changes and making sure those things are turned on. Because if you're not logging the things that happen on the system, if you don't have all the audit settings turned on that CIS recommends, then control number six is a lot less effective. When you go to check your logs to figure out what happened, that information might not even be there because you didn't turn on your logging. I've been at a lot of different customers where we start looking at the CIS policies and I just say, let's create a report just on the audit configuration settings and take a look. And sure enough, they'll have you know a few dozen systems where um, most of those policies are turned on. You might have you know 15 out of 20 turned on. But then you'll have a few other systems where only 10 are turned on or five. Um, they're not rolled out consistently across their systems. Why is that? In a lot of cases, you thought that you were rolling things out consistently across your Windows or Linux boxes, but maybe you're not. And that means for a lot of systems, you, you're blind to what's going on. So you really want to make sure um, and start with, I believe, the audit policies in the CIS checks and then work your way out from there. Um, That's a, this is such a great point, Mike, because, you know, if you talk to the CIS, they'll actually tell you, we don't have priorities for the various controls within our hardening recommendations. They're all important. And mm -hmm. I believe that if you were to send a report to some administrator with 100 things to fix on 100 servers, they would just put that report to the side and carry on with what they were doing, right? It's too much to work with. If you yeah. establish priorities for the organization based on, look, if we're not providing that audit data from the get-go, then we've got problems. We're going to start there. You can have a much more focused approach to how we're going to remediate these insecure configurations appropriately. And it's amazing, as you say, how often you find out, wait, I thought all those servers were the exact same. They're not. They're not. And the, the other reason I generally start with the audit policies is they can be a quick win for you. They're um, pretty easy to turn on. They pretty much never cause an outage. You're just turning on more logging for the system. So in these days, most systems have enough bandwidth and load to handle uh, creating a few more audit messages. And that's really what you want to try and do is start to, to um, get information from these systems, make sure you're secure, and you know, use Tripwire's SCM policies to make sure that these things stay configured correctly. Um, in fact, I don't even care if you use Tripwire to do this. Secure your configurations somehow, some way, get a process in place and start doing the audit policies um, on your systems. It's one of the most important controls you can do out of CIS. So I'm going to take a, a slightly more partisan angle and just say that the way that Tripwire approaches this is really unique in the industry. And what I mean by that is that um, because Tripwire Enterprise understands what files and directories and registry keys are on your system, it understands how it's configured, uh, and we're able to see changes, the way that we get the data to analyze your configuration is a little bit different. And what I mean by that is that when you want updated results, you don't, within Tripwire, need to rescan your entire environment because mm -hmm. Tripwire is essentially finding what has changed and only sending that back into our console. And then we reassess any tests that analyze data that just changed because their results might now be different. And so right. in an incredibly efficient way, tied to the change that insecure configuration comes from, we're giving you those updated results. I, I think that's an important side of that. Right. Plus, if somebody makes a change or some system makes a change, I've seen cases where um, patch updates would turn a configuration setting back to the default. Um, it's good to know how those things changed into an insecure state because Tripwire tracks it as a change first. Um, you can see that. And, you know, that's another important area is doing analysis of how things happen in your environment and why. 
Um, and knowing what happens in your environment gets to our next slide, uh, unplanned outages, because usually that's, you know, something goes wrong and they say, well, what changed? Um, if you can answer that question, what changed, you can generally find that mean time to repair very quickly, like a change to a group policy object, the firewall configuration, you know, did those changes happen as expected? I, I remember there was, we were rolling out Tripwire at a customer site. It had only been there for about a week. We had rolled it out to a bunch of systems, and our professional services guy was still on site working with the console and the new Tripwire administrator when they had an outage, a big outage. And of course they ran in, Tripwire's the newest thing on the system, right? So blame Tripwire, Tripwire's caused an outage. So the Tripwire professional services guy and the TE admin said, well, okay, well let's look in Tripwire and see what changed. You know, maybe we can figure out what happened. So they looked at the various change reports and one of them was Active Directory changes. And they looked at the group policy object change and said, hey, this changed right about the time your outage began. Do you think this had an effect on it? And the IT manager looked at it and said, oh, yeah. Can I get these reports from now on? <laughs> um, you know, the mean time to repair went way down in that case. And knowing what changed um, really did help them. So it wasn't necessarily just about security in this case. You know, this is about availability. That's a great point, Mike. And, you know, so one of the things that we typically talk about is that customers will come often come to Tripwire because they've got some sort of a compliance requirement. Our goal is to help our our company, our, our customers ex experience and practice IT best practice security. But the mm -hmm. fact is that if operations isn't happening, if, if our critical application isn't working right now, then we're going to worry less about compliance and security, and we're going to worry a lot more about getting that application back up and running. And I know, Mike, you've been in the meeting, you know, where I, as the person responsible for this critical application without which my company cannot do business, and I pull together a room full of people, I'm sweating bullets because management has said to me, for every minute you're down, we're losing X dollars or customers or reputation. This needs to work. Get it back up and running, or I'll find somebody who will. Right, so now I am stressed out, and I assemble the application people, but not just the application people. I need the infrastructure folks because the thing that caused this problem might be at the OS level rather than at the application level. It might be a problem or a change to the database, the backend database, or an Active Directory change that changed permissions on a critical object so that the application can no longer work. Right, it could be any of those things. You just don't know. And so being able to pull together that, that view of here are all the changes that could affect my application means that your team is going to have real tools to work with to reduce that mean time to repair. Yeah. And Brian, sometimes it's not just what changed. It can be what didn't change. So I, there was a, a prospect we had. Well, they became a prospect and a customer because they had a big outage in their Linux server farm. They had rolled out a change with their provisioning tool. The provisioning tool said it rolled it out, said it was successful everywhere. A few days later, they had a big outage. And it took them about a week to figure out that the change to their application actually didn't make it completely on three of the servers. So they decided we, needed, we need to know that these things are actually successful. Um, so they used Tripwire from then on to ensure that that application was installed the same way across all of their servers. So the provisioning tool would then push it out. Tripwire would see that the tool did its changes, mark those changes as authorized based on the provisioning tool. But then they would use our reference node variance report to make sure that that application was in, in fact successfully installed the same on every system. The side benefit of that was if somebody did make changes to that application on one server or two servers, but not on the others, that's a potential for an outage as well. And they could see that. In fact, they did afterwards. That happened one time. And uh, they were telling me how that saved them. 
That, so, that's terrific, Mike, because it, it, it's such a good point. It's not just what changed, but what didn't and should have. Uh, and I, I have this, a similar experience where I was working with a customer. It was a retailer. They had um, pushed out changes the night before. I'm in talking to them the next morning. They pushed out changes the night before. Uh, the you know the IT guy who had pushed the changes, his tool said push successfully, all good. Uh, he goes home at four in the morning, very happy, got it all done. At six o'clock in the morning, they start getting calls from store managers who are trying to log in, and they're getting the login as administrator to complete the upgrade. And none of them are administrators. None of them have that ability. So it was a huge mess for their retailer outfit to you know get their stores up and running effectively. Mm -hmm because they didn't verify that the change had actually finished implementing the way it was supposed to. And yeah, so we didn't detect the changes on those systems. So it, what it comes down to is, you know, as I wrote here, all changes are not equal. Um, there are standard changes that happen, things we call business as usual changes. You have patches. In fact, for a lot of my customers that are tracking changes in their environment with Tripwire, Patches are the majority of the changes. So if you have a way to look at the patches, grab a manifest, and mark those changes as authorized, that takes care of the majority of what you have to look at, especially if you're trying to, um, you know, say, meet PCI standards where you have to know um, whether changes to critical systems were authorized or not. Well, if that change is part of a patch, I can automatically mark it as authorized. In fact, you need automated ways to look at your changes to try and you know take care of all of the expected changes that um, are part of your process. So you know the three main ways customers do that with us is you know Tripwire DSR, dynamic software reconciliation. If you're not using that, you probably want to talk to your account rep to find out about getting that added to your tripwire console because marking all those changes that come in um, in an automated way is authorized is a huge time save um, and makes the you know makes your reports much more accurate um, of course integration to ticketing systems um, whether it's ServiceNow, jira churwell you know we, we integrate with tons of them but um, in the case of applications a lot of times you need a change ticket to change your application. If we can pull those change tickets down and compare them to the changes we did detect for that application, that's a, a great way to mark those all as authorized in an automated way and have a way for your auditors to verify that what you said you were going to do in the ticket is in fact what you actually did on the, on the endpoint. So, so such, again, a great point to, to be able to wrap that up and attack, mm -hmm. for example, a report showing here are all the changes that are associated with this ticket, attach it to the ticket. When it comes audit time, you don't even have to talk to the auditor. It's all right there. They can look it up. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I like to go over with my, my clients is what process made the change? Was that process allowed? You'd be shocked at how many different types of processes make changes on your systems, um, I, you know, I, I've created reports for customers of the audit events from Tripwire, and you might see, you know, a couple of dozen different processes that make changes on those endpoints. And getting control of what's making changes on the endpoints is a great way to start tightening up security. So. Uh, you know, I had a, a case with a um, another Linux uh, environment where they had an administrator change the um, DNS settings or the resolve.conf file for that Linux box, and which caused an outage because he put in the wrong information. And so at that point, they started, you, they set Tripwire to monitor that in real time so that if anybody changes the DNS entries on their systems, they get a, an alert about it immediately. So the funny thing that happened with that, though, was I, I, it was some months later, they started getting changes to their the, the resolve.conf file showing up in real time in their reports. And an admin, TE administrator got alerted to that and told security because the process that made the change was not one of their authorized processes. It turned out it was 
malware, making changes to the DNS entries to try and you know exfiltrate data. And it had landed on a couple of systems. They detected the breach immediately and were able to um, you know clean up that mess before anything bad happened or anything worse happened. Yeah, that, that, that terrific story. And I think it really points to the idea that, um, you know, in order to figure out the changes that aren't supposed to happen, you kind of need to wade through the changes that were supposed to happen. Automating that as much as possible allows you to focus your time and energy on the stuff that truly needs eyeballs on uh, to see if right. that's you know, something that you need to do something about. So that's why sometimes I like to use Tripwire for analysis to get back to my point about what process made the change. Um, filter those audit events, see what applications were making changes to try and get a handle on it. Um, and I, I've done this with people where we pull that into an XML file, we're exported from Tripwire, and then import that into a, a spreadsheet, filter on the application, make it unique, and you can see which applications are making changes on the endpoint. Should they all be making changes on the endpoint? Should a lot of that work be done by your provisioning tool, if you have a provisioning tool? If you don't have a single tool that's supposed to be making changes on your endpoint, maybe you should. But the, the, the problem I've seen where you have dozens and dozens of different processes that are allowed to make changes on the endpoint is that when malware makes a change, it's hard to tell that it was a process that shouldn't have been making changes. So by getting control over what's making changes, knowing and, and basically signing off on the processes that are allowed to make changes, you can then use Tripwire to mark those changes as authorized based on the process and you know, really make any changes that don't use your process stand out. Yes, and uh, you know, and, and and having that monitoring going on at all times, I think, is the the critical piece there. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to just touch on another sort of customer story that I think uh, is really helpful in illustrating the importance of automation, and it actually comes from uh, the utility space. Uh, where uh, NERCSIP, uh, which is the critical infrastructure protection for uh, the utility companies um, mm -hmm. standard, uh, if, if the entities are found to be non-compliant with that standard, they can be fined up to a million dollars a day per instance of non-compliance. So right. not surprisingly, they take this very seriously. Mm -hmm. And one of the requirements was around being alerted when unauthorized ports or services open on their critical infrastructure. So mm -hmm. prior to Tripwire, the solution was that they would spend person weeks uh, sending someone around to run Netstat on all of their systems, gather the data about the open ports and services, throw that into a document where they would then provide rationale for why these ports and services were to be allowed for these devices. They close wow. a few ports or services that shouldn't have been open on those devices. So there was some security value there. And then, you know, at the end of it, they finish up the report. The auditor shows up, says, where's your report? They hand it over. Check, right? 100% mm -hmm. compliance value. They are able to comply with that requirement. So from a compliance perspective, very good. What about from a security perspective? And the idea is you've got, at that point, a point in time audit. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're only going to do that once an audit cycle. You are not going to send someone around every time you make a change to your infrastructure to then see if there are any new ports or services that need to be investigated. All right, so that's the right. background. Person weeks every audit si cycle invested in gathering this data, point mm -hmm. in time audit, uh, not particularly effective from a security perspective. With Tripwire's whitelist profiler uh, Tripwire app, we're actually, our customers are now able to know within minutes when an unauthorized port or service opens up. Mm -hmm. When it comes time for the auditor to show up, it literally takes two minutes to run the report and boom, they still get that checkbox. Much more importantly, they're getting real security value out of this activity that was initially purely compliance oriented. And right. what's interesting is that most of the time when they talk to the system owner and say, "What's why, why is this port or service open and running on this server? They'll say, oh, sorry, guys, it's a new application. We didn't you know, tell anybody we were going to need that port, that service. Uh, however, 
sometimes they find that it's like, oh, I, I threw Dropbox on there because I needed to get a big file over to that server and I didn't have a better way. Sorry, I forgot to take it off, right? And that's right. exactly what we're talking about in terms of being able to monitor that in a more effective ongoing way. Ongoing. That is automated and doesn't require a ton of manual effort to get there. Right. It, ongoing checks are, you know, hugely important. I mean, because I, I was at a uh, doing a tripwire POC at a place, and it turns out, you know, they 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 noticed a bunch of um, CIS ch critical c checks that were failing that you know were passing previously on. They were doing those checks with another product at the time. They could only run it about once a week because it it you know created so much load they couldn't do it during production days, but on the weekends they would run it. And I want to be clear like, that but, I want to be clear that this is that other tool, right? That, okay, good. yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, because Tripwire pulls the data in and is much more efficient about it. We do all the CIS checks generally in the console, but what we found out was so they started tracking changes to those files of, as well, and what happened was on Friday night, all those files that were part of those critical checks were modified. And then they ran their other product, ran its check over the weekend. It passed all those security checks. And then on Monday, they saw a bunch of changes in Tripwire on those files again. And when we ran the policy check with Tripwire on Monday afternoon, sure enough, they were failing all those checks. What had happened was the Linux administrators didn't like locking down the systems that much. So they wrote a set of scripts that would secure the systems in time for the policy checks. And then on Monday, they would run another set of scripts that loosened everything up, loosened all the security on those systems to make their lives easier. So doing a point in time checks, it doesn't necessarily secure you. So that was, um, that was an interesting one that we saw. Plus they knew who was doing it because Tripwire was tracking the changes and they got the who information on the configuration files as they changed. So it was kind of a, um, you know, a double win for the risk and compliance team that was running Tripwire at that point. So, um, yeah, we're, we're running into a uh, point where we start to wrap up here, I think, Brian. And I can't hear you, Brian. So, um, not sure if Brian lost. Um, yeah, Brian lost audio. So I will keep going. Um, so you have the CIS critical security controls. Um, we, you know, you need to do the basics. Um, you know, one one through six. And let me stay on the critical checks here. Um, you know, if you aren't doing vulnerability management, talk to your Tripwire account rep. We have IP360 to help you with one through three. It integrates with Tripwire Enterprise to help you with number five. And, and by doing number five, that's going to help you with number six as well. Um, and Brian's dropped all together. Oh, no, I'm in control. Um, so... Uh, Doing point in time checks is not a good idea. Um, you need continuous checking going on. Uh, as you're tracking the CIS checks and getting your hardening done, part of configurations, and I've had some customers that um, confused configuration, you know, security checks, we'll recall them, um, CIS uh, critical controls and the policy checks with the configuration of their operating systems, for instance. And those sound like they're the same thing, but when your application is, um, you have the hash of all the files of your application, they would consider that a configuration. And in a lot of cases, that is how your system is configured. What version of each application are you running? Um, have those versions changed? Are they running the right versions? And are they installed the same way across systems? That's one way to do configuration checks. The other is to look at the actual settings of things like 
you know, login policy, um, success or failure. And, you know, are the, is the, the FTP service up or down? Um, it should be down on pretty much all your systems. Um, if you need to run FTP on a system, Tripwire has a way to create a waiver so that you can uh, document the exception for your auditors. So, you know, doing the CIS critical controls is one of the most basic things you can do. It does help you with audits and auditors are, you know, starting to, to crack down a little bit more on these configurations because it's been found that it's one of the most important security controls you can have in, in order to stop breaches. Um, and then of course, making sure you're logging everything you should so that you can do number six. If you don't have information, then you can't find out what happened. So those are critical as well. Um, and I think we're at about the point where we can start taking some questions. So uh, let me see what we've got here. Um, we've got a few minutes for that. Um, so we'll, will the Tripwire Enterprise version do the number five controls I mentioned, or do we need IP360? Um, no, Tripwire Enterprise has, Tripwire Enterprise is made up of two parts of the product. One is the change audit or file integrity monitoring, and the other side is system configuration management or SCM as we call it. And the SCM controls, um, the way Tripwire does that is baseline the configurations and then do the CIS checks against the data we've baselined, which is why we can tell when somebody makes a change to those configurations, you can see the change. Um, it's how Tripwire does its file integrity monitoring. Um, so, you know, CIS has tools available to measure server and network configurations to their benchmarks, yes. How does Tripwire compare with what is available from CIS? We pretty much take the, we, no, not pretty much, we take the CIS standards and create content in Tripwire that checks all of those things for, you know, a Windows system, um, Windows 2016, Windows 2019, um, uh, Red Hat 6, Red Hat 7, Red Hat 8, uh, uh, Cisco um, switches. Uh, we, we have all that content in Tripwire already built. The difference between the CIS tool really and Tripwire is more in how it's um, deployed. Uh, Tripwire is, of course, tracking changes to the files and pulls them in and then does the CIS checks, the same ones that the CIS security tool does. But it does it in a centralized way. You're running it from one product and you're also tracking the changes to it. So the way Tripwire does that is actually pretty efficient. Um, I, can I just throw one more thing on there, Mike? Sure. Um, there are a couple of other, I think, advantages to the Tripwire approach. One is that you know you can run not just CIS checks, but and you might have mentioned this NIST or COBIT or ISO twenty seven thousand and one. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in the end, your devices are configured the way they're configured, and the policies give you a, a lens through which to view that that configuration in different from different perspectives. We've also mm -hmm. built out uh, po compliance policies that are essentially based on and derivative of and subsets of the more full-on security standards like PCI and SOX and HIPAA. And my point there is mm -hmm. that because you can build or run a report like that. But like we, our recommendation is that you drive towards a full on security standard, but you can use that compliance report for the auditor uh, that you know wants to see the data in the order that they expect it based on how they think about things. Right. So we can help mm -hmm. you there. And I say almost more importantly, it's very straightforward within our solution to build a policy that's based not on compliance on, or security, but based on operations. And right. so the idea is that if you are at your critical application admins have in their heads a set of things that they go check when your critical application stops working. Mm -hmm. Sadly, they built that list up typically through cold, hard experience. And yeah. sadly, when they get a new job, they're going to take their list with them and the new person has to come in and relearn those things through cold, hard experience. 
With Tripwire, it's very straightforward to build a policy that's based on the settings that indicate whether your critical application will continue to function properly or not. And you can there document when this setting gets misconfigured, here's how to fix it. You can document mm -hmm. the importance of that. And then you can often also see the person who made the change that caused the problem. And so right. the idea is instead of waiting, uh, as you mentioned, like a week or two to even find out you had a problem, Tripwire can alert you to that you know, as that change happens. So right. there's, I got there's, an example. Go ahead. So I, I was one of our customers um, had a, a, a they, I helped them build this policy check. They had a backup product that was on each of their systems, and that backup product had a configuration file. One night, their IT guys were doing some testing on a production box overnight during the maintenance window, and they didn't want the backups to run and slow down what they were doing. So they went into the configuration file and turned off the backups on that system. You can guess what happened next. They forgot to turn this setting back on. About a month or so later, they went to restore the backups on that system, and there weren't any, which, of course, cost an out, caused an outage. There was a cost associated with that and, you know, trying to redo the recovery. So I helped them build a policy check. We, you know, we baselined that configuration file and then build a policy check to ensure that the backup setting for all of their systems was set to backup. If they ever did something like that again, they would know right away that the file changed. And if they didn't put it back into compliance so that the backups would run. So it doesn't have to be a CIS check um, necessarily to create you know, operational efficiencies. Policy tests can be used for all kinds of settings. Terrific, thank you. We on to the next question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the question is uh, from Rolando Alvarez. Uh, and he asks, what considerations should be taken with the CIS security controls now that everybody is working from home? Do you want to have a go, Mike? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question because, you know, I, I don't know that there's any special considerations from home or not because, you know, the CIS checks are the same for, you know, your laptops and your servers um, in your VPN concentrators as they were, um, you know, before you started working from home. You really should have been doing the CIS um, uh, configurations before that. But if you weren't, they may be, you know, even more important with a workforce at home um, to make sure that everything's getting logged at, a, at the very least. Because when there are problems or if somebody gets in where they're not supposed to, you want to make sure you're, you have those logs. So, you know, maybe you use Tripwire to baseline your, your VPN servers and such and write some policy checks against those configurations. Um, and, and Mike, you know, for the applications that they're using as well. Mike, it's, it's an interesting question and a consideration yeah. because oftentimes, you know, with people working at home or from home, they're using laptops. And that yeah. means that they're not necessarily available to send log data all the time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like that. And maybe you lose some, uh, some data along the way. And it actually, right. it puts me in mind of another sort of, uh, so going back to the utility example, uh, many utilities use Tripwire uh, Log Center because we've got an agent for capturing logs. And this is particularly helpful for Windows machines that don't have syslog out by default. Uh, and, you know, working with w WMI can be problematic particularly when you're working through mm -hmm. firewalls, for example. And so having an agent that doesn't just send the log data, but actually makes sure that the listener is listening. And if it isn't, then caches that data locally until such time as the listener is listening so that it can then send that log data along. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendous boon, you know, in this day of people working from home, not always connected to the network. Yeah. And, and we're almost out of time. So I wanted to make sure I got to the last, uh, to, to the next question here. Um, Jack was asking, you know, so security can be reduced to a known sequential list driven effort. And I don't know if it can be reduced to that, but CIS has created a list that's kind of like a checkbox for defense in depth. Um, and if you do those things, you will reduce the risk um, 
in your environment. And, you know, I, th- I do think the list, and they've revised the order several times over the years, and it may get revised again. But the, um, I, I, I do think that a sequential list-driven effort definitely will help you because it's prioritizing for you. And if you can check things off the list as you go, you know you're getting stuff done instead of, you know, just going after a grab bag of security products and then trying to get things, um, you know, trying to, to stay on top of all that information. I realize there's a whole security um, set of tools out there that actually try to do that and take information from various security products and try and um, give you information and and intelligence out of all that data. Um, but, you know, if you're not going down through the list, if you, you know, don't know what all your systems are in the environment and you're not tracking them, that's a hole. You know, if you don't know what all the software is in your environment and you, you, you aren't able to monitor it all, that's another hole. And you um, can't if, do vulnerability management because you don't right. have the data. Exactly. So, you know, those little holes are what, you know, either hackers take advantage of or potentially are just things that cause outages. Um, I do like to say that, you know, Tripwire is not just a security product. Operationally, it can definitely, and it has, when people know that Tripwire is monitoring what they're doing, they tend to follow process better, which reduces downtime. I know it's hard to measure all the downtime you didn't have because they were doing things correctly. But if you do have outages fairly often because people aren't following process, um, using Tripwire to try and enforce process um, should help those numbers. Indeed. Uh, And then Cesar writes, uh, so your recommendation is uh, to check the controls from 1 to 20 because they've got dependencies. And essentially, yes. Uh, What I like to point out is that Tripwire had nothing to do with the writing of the CIS-20 critical security controls or their order. It just turns out that we have solutions for five of the six basic controls, and we actually have solutions for several of the other controls within the list of 20. Uh, and it fits very nicely with our message of, you know, do the, back to the basics, do the basic IT security actions as defined by the standard of care in the industry today, which is the CIS 20. Uh, and you'll not only um, be attacking IT security in the way the industry says is best practice, uh, but you're going to make your audit burden a lot easier, too. I mean, there are lots of downstream positives to that. Mike, you were going to yeah. say something. And I was. I was going to say, you know, Brian and I did do a Tripwire blog post on this topic, you know, for people that couldn't make this webinar or, you know, would like to read it more detail about the this topic. But I did start that webinar with the story of, you know, Vince Lombardi, um, what he did with his players at the beginning of every season. You'd have all these big pro football players who have been playing for years, but you know, Vince wanted to make sure, especially after they lost the championship one year, he came into the, the locker room on the first day of practice and he said, we're going to start with the basics. And he held up the football and said, this mm-hmm. is a football. <laughs> when Vince took them back to the basics, he started from the basics and they did. They started with basic blocking, basic tackling and would start their 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 season that way in order to become champions. And, you know, CIS recognizes that going back to the basics is a really good way to become a security champion. I know that's a bit of hyperbole, but. (laughs) I like it. Uh, So Liz, uh, I think uh, you want to wrap us up. Yeah, thanks Mike and Brian. Um, And I went ahead and just sent out that link to the, the blog that Mike mentioned if everyone wants to access that. Um, But, yeah, thanks to everyone. I'd like to thank our speakers, Mike and Brian, for their very informative presentation. And a huge thank you to our audience for attending and for bearing with us through some technical difficulties at the end there. But we're happy that 
Brian was able to jump back on. Um, we hope you found the presentation informative and useful to you. We had some really great questions that came through. So as a fun bonus, I'm going to be sending everyone the Ask a Question a prize after the event. Um, so make sure to join us for, for future events. We will also send out a link to the on-demand version of the webinar, as well as information on how to receive CPE credits for today at the conclusion of the event. But that's uh, Liz, all that we have today. Yeah. Liz, is it is it too late for me to ask a question now? So I can get a prize? For it. No. Right. <laughs> I'll send you guys something after the event. Thanks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank thanks you. again, everyone. Um, it's really great to have you all today, and we hope to hope to see you for future events. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.